once on the verge of extinction, exterminated from its historic range. Restoring an animal that was once destroyed on purpose by our government, that's a real change in attitude. When we started the recovery program, we thought we were going to lose the grizzly bears. One of the greatest conservation stories in American history is also one of the most controversial. Yellowstone and its wildlife is part of our history as a country, and it's part of the hearts and minds of millions of people from all across the nation. The interaction between the bears, the wolves, and the elk, it's the American Serengeti. Everybody could agree that Wolves in Yellowstone Park is a great deal and there's all positive stuff, but we knew that we put Wolves in Yellowstone that it wouldn't stop there. As grizzlies and wolves surpass recovery goals and continue to expand, Wyoming faces the complex task of balancing the needs of these large predators with the needs of other wildlife and of people. We'll take a look at their history, their road to recovery, and how the Wyoming Game and Fish Department is managing them today. The biggest challenge will be finding a way to address those competing interests for the same piece of land. To those who live on the land and make a living on the land, uh, I see no benefit to those species being here. I don't think the American public is going to stand for treating them as vermin. The political rhetoric is, oh, we want to kill every wolf we can and we want to wipe them out again, all that kind of stuff. That, that doesn't help. This area is special. Uh, we certainly have an added responsibility to try to maintain this ecosystem. If we see a bear, we whistle once, we yell, bear and then we quietly walk back into the building. Don't lose your focus when you're in the backcountry. We have large predators like grizzly bears, and if you know what to do, you can generally avoid conflicts. Grizzlies, to me, they're the epitome of what's wild and free. I don't see much noble about a wolf. The wolf could very well be our demise. The wolves are taking a hit for what a lot of the grizzly bears are doing. When they talk about predator control, nobody talks about shooting grizzly bears. Everybody talks about killing wolves. Maybe it's time for seeing where there might be some middle ground amongst everybody as well as middle ground with the predators. To see a wolf roaming once again in North America, not in a national park, it gives you hope for humanity that we may be able to pull this off. Wolf issues are so emotional, people use wolves to demonstrate their values to other people. And a lot of the debate really has nothing to do with science, it has to do with human values. Two powerful living symbols of the American wilderness are the grizzly bear and the wolf. And Wyoming is at the heart of a decades-long struggle to restore them to their native habitats. Now, with healthy populations of bears and wolves throughout the ecosystem, their future hinges on balancing the interests of predators, their prey, and the people who live among them. I'm pretty proud of the program. I think we've done a really good job. We've got more wolves in more places than we ever thought, and we've had fewer problems. You know, we've come a huge way. I mean, the bears are doing really well in the Yellowstone ecosystem. You know, a grizzly bear population is increasing at 4 to 7 percent per year is pretty amazing. But when you look at the size of where the landscapes that bears and wolves live in, uh, Yellowstone's small. And our bear density and our wolf density is high. And we're having grizzly bears uh, seen in areas of the ecosystem where they had not been seen for 50 years, 75, or 100 years. And I think despite a lot of debate, everybody agrees that Yellowstone is a different place. Wyoming isn't only about grand vistas. It provides some of the best remaining wildlife habitat in the lower 48. But wolves were eradicated from Wyoming's wildlands and most of the rest of the country in the early 20th century. And by the end of the 1960s, Wyoming's grizzlies seemed on an unstoppable slide toward extinction. 
Wolves and grizzly bears had a wide distribution in North America. Wolves throughout the entire North American continent, well into Mexico, with uh, grizzly bears essentially occupying the western part of North America. Bears have always been part of this portion of the country, one of the few places left where they weren't extirpated uh, as, as man moved west and settled the west. Wolves were extirpated from the state of Wyoming in the early part of the last century. That was because of conflicts, primarily conflicts with livestock. The wolf was eradicated by the federal government. They're the ones that paid the bounties. They're the ones that paid the trappers to come in and remove the wolf so that the ranchers could uh, run livestock, cattle, and sheep. The wolf had vanished from most of the lower 48. Grizzlies were mostly confined to Yellowstone National Park. Next to Old Faithful, they became the park's greatest attraction. Tourists flocked to see them gathered on the park's garbage dumps and tempt them with handouts. The near tragic result was bears dangerously habituated to humans and dependent upon human food. I remember on our fourth grade trip, we went into Yellowstone, our school trip, and I remember on the bus, my window was one of the few windows that fell down and, and it went, put it down, and there was a grizzly bear on the side of the road, and he stood up on the side of the bus, and I was collecting sandwiches from all the kids, feeding this bear. Literally, he would take it right out of my hand, out the window. I didn't realize at the time, as a young fourth grader, that I'm contributing to one of the biggest problems that we've ever had in this Yellowstone ecosystem, and that is bears associating people with food. Because once a grizzly bear gets a taste of human food, gets habituated to human food, is likely to be a dead bear. In 1959, twin brothers John and Frank Craighead began a pioneering field study of grizzly bears in Wyoming. The Craigheads refined the art of radio telemetry for tracking the movements of the bears. They filmed their behaviors and took biological samples and measurements. As their studies continued into the 1960s, the results made it clear that the grizzly's fate was a precarious one. In 1975, the bear was placed on the endangered species list. Grizzly bear is particularly vulnerable because it's the lowest reproducing mammal in North America. So a grizzly bear in Yellowstone has a hard time replacing herself in her lifetime. Because grizzly bears are so difficult to manage, because they reproduce very slowly, because there's lots of conflicts with people and people fear grizzly bears, they're a challenging species to recover. We didn't know if it was gonna work. We were developing this. Again, you look back at the, at the 70s when this started, the charge was don't let any bears die. We thought that there were perhaps as few as 30 adult females in the whole population, and that we were in a crisis that we couldn't stem the mortality. We started thinking at that time, what are some steps we can take to reduce these mortalities? And, and we would talk to hunters, we talked to outfitters, and we talked to us among ourselves, of what, what can we do to, to alleviate that? People just shrugged their shoulders when I would go into offices and talk about grizzly bears, you know, it's like, well, that's not our responsibility, or, you know, we can't really do anything. The success story was getting agencies to work together on reducing bear mortality, and then the public's buy-in. The evolution of the public's understanding of the grizzly bear's vital role in the ecosystem helped accelerate its recovery, as we'll learn when Wyoming Predators Prey and People continues. Edging toward extinction in the 1970s, the grizzly bear was enjoying the benefits of a vigorous recovery program within a decade. Putting in place a, a system to control mortality and building support um, in the people that live, work, and recreate in bear habitat has resulted in dramatic changes. Ultimately, it was the people that were gonna have to buy into it, and they did. And that's the real success story. Wyoming took on, at least from a state perspective, many of the responsibilities to bring that species back from the brink of extinction to where we have it today. Management-wise, we've done huge things for bears. I mean, there's over 1,200 miles of roads that are closed in important bear habitat. There's sanitation regulations, there's outreach and education. If you can't clean, the bears don't have any interest in you because there's no food for them to come into. We're getting away from those old Camp Robin bears and more into a wild, a wild bear. But those old campsites that have been used for years and years and had dumps, you know, anybody who knows anything about bears, they'll come back and check them for years on end. And it got to the point where, among outfitters and among backcountry users, 
if a bear did die and, and the camp was messy where it occurred, they said, you know, I have to do all these things and I'm doing them, it's working. If they don't, prosecute them. And there are quite a few bear-human conflicts on the periphery of the system as the bears push further out onto private land. Uh, Wyoming has more of those than any other state because Wyoming has more habitat in the Yellowstone ecosystem. Maybe the bittersweet fruit of grizzly bear recovery is that uh, we have lots of bears in lots of places, but that also means lots of interaction with people. Most of those interactions end up just fine, bear going its way uh, unharmed, the people going their way unharmed, but uh, occasionally property is damaged and, and a bear needs to be moved or managed. This is an example of a preventive management action in that we're catching a bear that we, we know is going to actually end up getting garbage because of where they're located. This gives us an opportunity to try to get ahead of uh, the game when it comes to um, keeping bears out of trouble. While he's sedated, we're going to uh, extract one of his premolars, which is evolving out of bears, so it's not a, a big problem to take that tooth. And we'll do a cross-section cut on this, and we'll be able to age this bear almost like you can age a tree by, by the rings. And then we'll take blood samples, we'll tag its ears and give it a, a lip tattoo as well because sometimes the ear tags will be ripped off bears. So this is a way to identify this bear. This bear now is on our history. If we do deal with this bear again, we'll, we'll immediately know whether it's been a problem bear or not. And so far it's not, so. So we have a very active management program and we encourage people to report conflicts. Uh, we'll respond, investigate them, do what we can to help them, um, clean up if it's an attractant related problem, help them clean up the attractant and store it properly. We'll capture and move the bear if we need to. And if it's a bear that's unsuitable for whatever reason to be released back into the wild, we'll remove it from the population, which is a nice way of putting that we kill them. We euthanize them. The Wyoming Game and Fish Department stays busy from spring through fall dealing with bears that come into conflict with people. These include both grizzly bears and, as in this case, black bears. There was a sow, a female with a cub that got on the Broadway in downtown Jackson, was able to dart her and the cub successfully and get her in a trap, and so that's who we're moving now. This road is a uh, it's an area we, you know, we relocate a lot of black bears and grizzly bears. This bear is more apt to stay continuing to forage on its natural foods as opposed to getting in the garbage. This is a much better spot for her than where she was in, on Broadway Street. She's going to have a much better chance of living longer and raising this cub successfully here as opposed to there. So. reinforce their wariness of humans. So that's what the purpose of the gunshots are for. She's weary of our presence, which is what we want to reinforce with her so that she doesn't find it acceptable to raise cubs in downtown Jackson. As existing grizzly bear populations recovered, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service introduced Canadian wolves into Wyoming and adjoining states in the mid-90s. It's been one of the most controversial wildlife stories ever. When Wyoming predators prey and people continues, we'll see that the success of the reintroduction has not ended the debate. Public support of recovery plans for the grizzly bear has increased over the years. Attitudes about the federal government's decision to reintroduce the wolf, on the other hand, continue to be mixed. This stems in part from the undisputable success of wolf recovery. The original minimum recovery goal for wolves in the northern Rocky Mountains was 300. Today, there are over 1,500 wolves. 
about 49% of the people that were surveyed that were Wyoming residents said they agreed with the reintroduction. Roughly 38 to 39% were opposed. So there were mixed feelings. We did the reintroductions under congressional mandate in 95, 96, and everything has gone uh, better than we'd ever hoped. We've got more wolves in more places and, and actually have had fewer problems than we predicted we would. The only reason we could even have wolf recovery is because the state fishing game agencies and sportsmen restored prey populations starting 50, 60 years ago. All game species need to be managed. There's no question about that. You look back in history, uh, way back at the turn of the century, we, we basically had no big game animals in the West, or even the entire United States. And through, through conscientious management of these species, we have more big game in the United States today than we've ever had. One of the greatest success stories of the North American wildlife management model is the recovery of, of a lot of wildlife species. The addition of the recovery of grizzly bears and, and gray wolves is just an, another chapter in that very successful uh, conservation model. All of the native carnivores that were here are here. They're also at probably the highest densities you'll find in North America. Wyoming's vast wildlife habitats have become a laboratory. Along with the prey species, the return of all the natural predators to the ecosystem has created a unique opportunity for scientific research. That research will help the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and others ensure the continued viability of bears and wolves in the ecosystem. What we're up here doing is we're watching a pack of wolves, and this is a study that we've done every uh, early winter and late winter since 1995. Well, we're trying to independently assess the kill rate, how often they're killing um, elk and other ungulates, as well as um, identifying whether they're cows or calves or bulls. We're following Agate Creek pack. There's 12 of them, uh, six adults and six pups. And we actually have the oldest wolf in the park in our pack. He'll be 10 in a couple weeks. So we're looking through spotting scopes that gives us about a 60 power magnification. But even in that, the, the image of these animals is very small. We continuously watch wolves from the ground and from the air. We watch three packs intensively from the ground and all the packs from the air. Researchers constantly monitor the progress of the wolf recovery program. This monitoring is carried out through observation and through capture and radio collar. He's a, I think he's gonna be a male pup. He's a male. 80% of all wildlife studies are less than three years. And we're in our 13th year here. And that's a very important statement to how complex the system is, how things change from year to year. No one year is the same. And so uh, uh, it's key that we stay at it and follow these wolves. Before studies like these, knowledge of the interactions among wolves, grizzlies, and their prey were as much speculation and myth as hard facts. Scientists now have the tools needed to separate fact from fiction and to open a new window into the intricate relationships among all the wildlife. Well, what we completed this morning was, uh, was an observation flight. We do these surveys to try to count as many females with cubs of the year as possible. We use the, the counts of, of females with cubs to come up with population estimates for the entire population and then we come up with, with a, uh, an allowable mortality allocation that, that we use to, to limit mortality in the system. You know, it's really different for grizzly bears there now. There's a lot more bears than there were 25 years ago and now there's wolves. And the interrelationship between bears and wolves is a really a dynamic one. Every kill wolves make in Pelican Valley from March, when the bears emerge from hibernation, to October, when they go back in, gets taken by a grizzly bear. That is phenomenal. It is not if, but when. The best science um, in the world on bears exists in the Yellowstone system. We know more about the Yellowstone grizzly bears than we do about any other grizzly bear population. When we started the study, we didn't think we'd be doing uh, wolf-bear kind of research, and uh, it's hard not to because this stuff's happening right in front of you. That intensive foundation of science is what we've built decisions on to 
get to the point of recovery and delisting. And the science will continue after recovery. Scientific data ultimately have no meaning until they are interpreted. And the way the data is interpreted is helping determine the structure of grizzly and wolf management in Wyoming. Grizzly bears are threatened by global warming and its effects on whitebark pine. And the seeds of whitebark pine are especially important for the grizzly bear's survival. Global warming is causing beetles to kill whitebark pine trees at an unprecedented rate, an alarming rate. Listing the grizzly bear under ESA doesn't prevent mountain pine beetle from killing whitebark pine. You know, one thing we're sure of, whether it's mountain pine beetle or global warming or fire, is that any natural system is a dynamic system. It's always changing over time. And what we've put in place is a whole series of indices to monitor all the things that we think could change and how those changes could affect the important issues related to bears like reproduction and survival. As these species are removed from the endangered species list, they transition from federal to state management. For both grizzlies and wolves, this is one of the main sources of controversy. The thing that's very difficult is to go from looking at wolves being protected as an endangered species, it's difficult for a public that's very enamored of wolves to go from that to a state management program that says we will include wolves in our program, how we manage other game, other animals. In the long term, uh, you know, we wouldn't be proposing delisting unless we were sure that this was going to maintain the grizzly bears in a healthy state. I don't think we'll ever get complete buy-off that wolves were brought back to Wyoming, but I think the majority of people accept the fact and expect them to be managed as a state wildlife resource, just as the other wildlife resources in the state are currently managed. Because of the way the federal government has, re has approached